It's true. When I grow up, I want to be a young adults pastor. I really do. I'm going to let Laura be the pastor of Trinity Church, and I'm going to be the young adults pastor. So I have a lot to share with you tonight, and I hope you'll stay with me because I I've never preached this before, and I hope it goes okay. I think it will. I feel like that song set it up so good. He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He's a faithful God. Gabe leaned over and said, gosh, that makes me think about David at Ziklag. I said, did I tell you that I was speaking on David at Ziklag tonight? He's like, no. So it made me feel like we had the right thing to say. I'm going, to read, I'm going to read the story to you out of the Bible, and it's kind of long, but I thought I could just tell it, but I'd rather read it. So here it is. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day, and the Amalekites had raided Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and they took captive the wives and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but they carried them off as they went their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured. I don't know what you're doing with two wives, but they were both captured. And Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, they were kidnapped. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking about stoning him. Each one was bitter in his spirit because their sons and their daughters had been kidnapped. But David found strength in the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him. And David inquired of the Lord, should I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue him, the Lord said. Pursue them, the Lord said. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So David and 600 men went with him to the Besor Valley where Some stayed behind. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley, but David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field, and they brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat and part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins, and he ate and he was revived. For He had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, what are you doing here? Who do you belong to? Where do you come from? He said, I'm an Egyptian the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became sick three days ago. We raided some territory that belonged to Judah, the the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. David asked him, can you lead me to the raiding party? He answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my man. Is this boring? You guys are okay with this? I know it's a lot. Did you read your Bibles today? Because this counts, all right? This counts. God gives you credit for this, just listening. Uh, Swear to me before God that you will not kill me, and I'll take you down to them. And he led David down, and they were and they were there. They were scattered over the countryside. They were eating, they were drinking, they were reveling because of the great amount of plunder that they had taken from Judah. And David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except. 400 young men who rode off on camels. David recovered everything that the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder, or anything else that had been taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. (laughs) Sounds like a pirate movie. Um, i found that life is a sequence of stories. Um, that's good and bad, but it, 
kind of suggests you can't really depend on anything to stay the same. I, I, I really thought that baseball would be a part of my life forever and ever and ever, but I haven't even watched a game in about three years. You know? I, I really thought when I was in high school and college that the friends I had in high school and college would be lifelong friends. I would stay with them forever, but I haven't spoken to a high school buddy in 40 years. I have no idea. I've pastored three churches. I really thought at every church, this is where I will give my life. This is where I will spend the rest of my days serving this community, this group of people. And uh, I, I ended up here, you know. Uh, no, it, was, it wasn't to get a reaction. I'm just telling a story. But it doesn't, it doesn't take much to start a new story in your life. Um, maybe, maybe an introduction to someone starts a new story in your life. Maybe a text, maybe a drive to the grocery store. I, I mean, it just doesn't take much to start a new story in your life. And, and what I'm trying to get to, I'll just try to say it, is that we tend to forget that we're in the middle of the story because we're so focused on what the, we expect the outcome of the story to be. It's like we're so concerned about the products of life that we forget the processes of life. I, I love the story of uh, Zacchaeus. He's actually one of my favorite Bible characters. You remember Zacchaeus, he was short, and the Bible says he was on the road to Jericho, and um, he positioned himself there so that, so that when Jesus passed by, he might have a chance to have an introduction to Jesus. He was short, so he climbed a tree. How many of you know this story in the Bible? So he climbed a tree, and here came Jesus, and, and Jesus looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you need to come down. I'm going to your house. I can't believe I remember for tea. That was the song we used to sing it in children's church. I'm going to your house for tea. It was actually supper. I'm going to go to your house. Zacchaeus calmed down. They went to their house. Everybody was upset because Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a bad person in the eyes of the culture. But there's a lot of detail to this story. He, he, Jesus ate with him and something happened in the middle of the meal where Zacchaeus says, you know, Jesus, I've decided that I'm going to give back to the people that I have stolen money from, I'm going to give it back to them. In fact, I'm going to give more than I've taken from them. And the Bible says, Jesus says, salvation has come to your house today. And it's a great outcome, but I'm trying to get you to focus on the road that led to the outcome. I'm trying to get you to see there's a story that processed the end result. I, I learned this week that 80%, it's a true fact, 80% of the people who win the big lottery are bankrupt after two years. That's because they went for the product without the process that allowed them to sustain. You, you don't want greatness without a road that leads you to greatness. You don't want to try to do things beyond the process that has prepared you to do great things. Am I making sense to anybody today? There has to be an incubation period. There, there, there has to be a, a, a process. I'm just trying to teach you tonight that there's a road to your victory. There's a road to your, to your conquest. There's a, there's a road to the glory that you're going to steward. There's a, there's a road to your wisdom in life, you see. And the stories that, that, that you carry really determine how you carry those stories determines the quality of your life. Um, how you navigate the road determines the level with which you will reign in life. I love that word, reign in life. In fact, if you have not underlined in your Bibles, Romans chapter five, verse 17, it should be one of your life verses. I, I'm recommending it. It says, for if, Romans five seventeen says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace 
and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through Jesus Christ. We've all got stories. We've got stories. We're in the middle of stories right now. We've got, we've got stories. In the, and the story that brings the good stuff, where there's good stuff in our stories. And I hope that has an effect on you because good stuff should cause us to be thankful. And, and, and sometimes our stories have bad stuff in them. And I don't know how the bad stuff affects you in the middle of your, of your story. But bad stuff has a tendency to paralyze spiritual formation. Sometimes good stuff paralyzes spiritual formation because we get so distracted by the goodness of it that we forget to give thanks. But sometimes bad, again, I just need a little affirmation here. I know you gave me tennis shoes already, but. I wanna, I'm talking to you today about spiritual formation, spiritual formation, because I think it's important for you to understand that there's something behind the stories of your life. We've talked a lot lately about this revelation that the gospel is more than helping orphan spirits become sons and daughters of the, of, the, of the Lord, you know, adopted into the family. We also now know that the gospel of the kingdom is that we go from orphans to sons to kings, to kings, but the, there's a road to your kingship. Can I say it like that? This is why I picked David, because he's on, a, he's on a story. He's on a road to his throne. And I just need to remind you, I'm trying to tag the idea with you that Revelation 1, 6 says, he has made us kings and priests unto God. He has made us kings and priests unto God. If you're gonna be a king in the kingdom, it basically means that there is some jurisdiction of your life, there's some part of your life where you literally have the authority to bring Father's heart, Father's authority, Father's will into the arena of jurisdiction over which you are the watchman, you are the ambassador, you are the representative. But I just need to warn you, you you're not going to be a king until you get on the road to become a king. There's a road to your reigning. There's a road to your reigning. And this is why I love this story about David because so clearly this is the road to his throne. And when I really read this this past week, I began to understand how many, as an older guy, how many of the episodes of his life I could relate to. And I thought I would try to live in my fatherly role here and say to you, there's a high likelihood that some of the things David faced and some of the things I've faced, you're probably going to face them too. Especially if you're serious about reigning in life. And so I've identified, oops, seven, not three, but seven. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> seven <sighs> pivotal moments in the spiritual formation of a king. I'll just go quickly. Number one, how you deal with change determines the capacity with which you can reign in life. How you deal with change. I wish I'd had time to put the, all this together so we could have it on a, but you can write it down or put it in your notes or whatever you want to do. How you deal with change is part of the spiritual form. David is in a crisis. Oh my goodness. He, he's a child of God. He's a worshiper of God. He has been anointed, identified, identity as a king. I know, I'm a king. I'm gonna be a king. Remember that he was Saul's partner. He was Saul's partner until they had a big fall up, a big fallout, a big breakup. David is in, in this moment, just, just before Ziklag, David, has pretended to be a crazy person and he's hanging out with the Philistines. I'm just telling you the, the, the story. David, David's identity is he's a Philistine killer, okay? He killed Goliath. 
This is what he's good at. Remember, they used to sing songs. Saul has killed thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. So David's identity is, I kill bad people, okay? That, that's part of what he is. But now, he's in a season of his life when he literally feels safer with his enemies than he did with his friends. When you're, hey, this is not a good night for small group orientation. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's hanging out with his friends. You don't expect your friends to throw a spear at you. If you're hanging out with your enemies, you're kind of on guard. You're like, I'm not sure what they're going to do. But when you're in a place that you think is supposed to be safe, you're supposed to relax. You're supposed to be trusting. You're supposed to, oh, my friend, I don't know if there's anyone in the sound of my voice tonight that has had serious church hurt. But if you've had any church hurt, I need you to understand that the way you process this road, uh, uh, it matters. Remember that David used to minister to Saul. He used to play the worship for Saul and Saul throws spears at him. I'm just saying that's a hard road to get past. But David has collected 600 church hurt, disoriented, misfit warriors. And they're living in Ziklag. Ziklag is a city governed by the Philistines. This is not Hebrew. This is not church land. This is enemy territory. He pretended to be crazy. He's living in Ziklag. And one day, the Philistines decide they've had enough of the Hebrews. We've had enough of King Saul. We're going to go kill King Saul. And David says, let me join you in the battle. Let me bring up the rear. You guys go kill Saul and I'll bring my 600 misfit warriors and we'll make sure and say, I don't know his intention. I don't know if David was really going to help kill the Hebrew king. The king the, I don't know if he was going to really kill Saul. Achish, the general of the Philistines, was nervous about David. His lieutenants said, don't let David go to this battle. He'll turn on you. He'll start killing Philistines. He's famous for killing Philistines. Don't let him participate. And so I don't know if David was going to kill the Philistines or if he was going to kill Saul. I do know that if he had actually killed Saul, he would never have been on the throne of Israel. And I don't know if you've ever had something that you really tried to participate in and you wanted it so bad and it turned out to be a disappointment and you realize later that the thing that disappointed you so much was actually protecting you on the road to your throne. But that's what was happening for David. I, I, I think I need to introduce something about, about the sovereignty of God here. Just There's a part of God that he does things and I don't know, part of what I was giving thanks for this evening as we were singing those opening songs about thanks is I just thank God for the unanswered prayers that he did not give to me when I was trying to kill Saul because he was protecting me on the road to my destiny. Well, Achish says, David, I, I like you and all that stuff, but my my lieutenants have voted and you're not gonna get to go in this battle with us, you have to go home. You have to go home, go back to Ziklag. And, and so, I don't know how to explain it, but David and his 600 misfit warriors, David has to pivot, David has to change, David has to adapt. And, and, and so, again, I'm trying to set the context of this story. He went to Ziklag because Saul had thrown a spear and pushed him out. Now he's having to leave Achish and his friends, the, the camaraderie that he's had there. He's having to, I'm just trying to get you to understand that this road to the throne is never a straight road. It has lots of twists and turns. 
has lots of different stories and sometimes they seem to contradict one another. And I just need to warn you, as an old man talking to some younger people, I just need to warn you that if you set your heart on the wrong plan and you hold on to it with such stubbornness, there's a really good chance you're gonna lose the greatness that God has ordained for you. So David goes back to his 600 misfit warriors and he says, guys, change of plans. I thought we were gonna get to go to battle, but we're not gonna get to, we're gonna have to adjust. And I guess that what you should write in your notes about this part of the lesson is don't be rigid. Don't be rigid. Don't, don't hold on to the revelation of unclean meat. What if Peter, when the unclean meat had come down from heaven, what if Peter had, well, he did say, he said, Lord, I would never eat of this meat. You, back in Leviticus, it says I should never eat the, the, the unclean meat. I can't do this. I can't change. I can't adapt. Can you imagine how constrained the revelation of grace to the Gentiles would have been if he had stayed rigid in something that he learned in his early faith when God says, okay, that was foundational, but now we're gonna move to a fresh revelation of what God, it's a new story in a new turn on the road that's taking you to your throne. And I've just come to say, be flexible. You're gonna have to change a lot. You're gonna have to change a lot. I remember when Jesus told his mother, I wasn't there, but I read, it in the, I read it in the Bible. I remember when Jesus told his mother, said, it's not yet my time. And, and yet he went ahead and turned the water into wine anyway. I remember when he told the woman at Sidon, he said, it's not right for me to give the children's bread to the Gentiles. And yet he went ahead and healed the little girl. Anyway, it seemed to me Jesus was flexible. Honestly, I feel like I've learned more theology in the last two years than the previous 40. I feel like the, rev the revelation of God has become more brilliant. I, I don't know. I don't know, I just think it's important for you to be able to pivot when you need to pivot. <laughs> 28 years ago, uh, I, think, I think we first got the phone call about Trinity Church when we were in St. Petersburg. I think it was in January. January, we got a phone call. It said, hey, the, there's a church in Cedar Hill, Texas, and some people are thinking about inviting you to become the pastor of that church. How do you feel about it? I literally heard the Holy Spirit on the phone say, you're going to pastor Trinity Church, Cedar Hill. I hung up the phone, turned to Beck, said, Beck, get ready. We're going we're gonna to move to Cedar Hill, Texas. I don't know where that is, but I, I heard the Lord. We're going to be the pastor of this, of this church. And, and uh <clears throat> And I really, I just had that conviction, but from January, then February, March, April, May, June, July, we like nothing happened. We never heard. We're like, they quit calling. They quit talking. I, I would call. I would say, what's happening? They're like, well, we're looking at somebody else. And oh, this guy, you know, is a candidate and we don't know. And, 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 and so about, I'm just going to say about September, I was like, well, dude, this is not going to happen. I must have missed God. I must have misunderstood what this was all about. And so I decided that what I would do was pour my heart into the church that I was currently serving, St. Petersburg, Florida. I would just give everything. And so I called this huge leadership retreat, got all my staff together, everybody that was a leader in the church. We went to an offsite, and that was the weekend that I was going to cast vision for the glad tidings of Assembly of God in St. Petersburg, Florida. I was so excited about it. Literally, the retreat was going to start at seven o'clock on a Friday night. At six o'clock on a Friday night, I got a phone call from a guy in Cedar Hill, Texas, and says, "If you want to be the pastor of Trinity Church in Cedar Hill, you need to get on a flight at in tomorrow morning. We've already made you a reservation, and you need to preach this Sunday in Cedar Hill. That's the only way it can happen. If it doesn't happen, the church is going to. And there were some other things that were going to that were going to happen." So I walked into the retreat and I said, guys, I have some news for you. I thought we were going to go to war, but I'm going to go to Cedar Hill, Texas. I don't know what the application of the story is. 
So you have to change. You have to. You just have to be able to pivot. You have to be able to be flexible. Number two. The, the, the last ones are quicker, okay? Number two, on your road to the throne, you need to know how to process your pain. You're gonna have to learn to process your pain if you're gonna reign. So it's time, it's t- David's like, guys, I know that I told you we were going to go to battle, but we're not going to be able to go to battle. So let's just go back to Ziklag. And, and I'll just remind you, when soldiers go home, it's a big deal, right? You see that on like halftime shows, like the soldier comes and hugs the little girl and they're all crying and everybody's crying. So it's a big deal when soldiers go home. And so these soldiers are going back to Ziklag and there is the expectation for this reception Okay, like when you go home after you've been at battle, there's good, there should be a parade, there should be banners, there should be a lot of, and I know that this is kind of a tangent, but I need to say it because you honored me so, so much tonight. Can I just say, the way you receive someone opens or closes heaven. No, 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 learning to receive is part of your spiritual formation. I, I don't know if I'm saying this, like Clark went with me last night to the Brazil campus. I'd never been to the Brazil campus before. It's up in Plano. Were you there? Were you there? Were you there? Well, why are you cheering if you weren't there? Oh, because you're Brazilians. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. So I went to the Brazil campus. Like, I'm not kidding you. Like, I don't know how I'm going to live with myself after you honored me. But last night, I'm telling you, I walked in and you would have thought the fourth person of the Trinity was walking in to this campus. It was like food. And there was like, oh, we're so honored that you're here. And we're so good. And I'm just telling you, the way you receive something matters. I'm going to go back to Brazil anytime they ask me to go. Because because they received me in a way that makes me want to be there some more. I don't know if you've learned to receive from the Lord yet. Okay, Katie, Katie, do y'all know my daughter Katie? Katie always buys Father's Day gifts for me. So she buys clothes, she always buys clothes. She always buys clothes. She's not here, so I'll tell this illustration. When she first presents the clothes to me, I'm always like, I don't know if I have the courage to wear that or not. (laughs) Like, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know. I don't know. But I've learned to receive her gifts because I want her to keep bringing me gifts (laughs) because eventually I know I'm going to like what it is that she got me. Does this make sense to you? And so I'm just saying, if you want some more gifts, you need to receive the ones that you have really well. Learn to receive well. And God's like, dude, they really love what I gave them. I'm going to keep giving it to them more and more and more. See? So anyway, these soldiers are on, they're on their way to the house and they're, they're going to, they're expecting a reception. They're expecting that they're going to be, there's going to be some dancing and there's going to be some, some hugs and there's going to be, you know, a, a, I don't know, maybe a barbecue or, 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 or whatever. But um, I, I have this story, but I'm t- I won't tell you, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because like I was, in, I was a college student in Springfield, Missouri, and I had a girlfriend in, back at home in Columbus, Georgia. I had a girlfriend in Springfield too, but I had a girlfriend in... <laughs> in Columbus, Georgia, and I, did, and I decided that I was going to, I decided I was going to surprise the, I was going to surprise the girlfriend in Columbus, Georgia, so I drove all night from college, and I just had this imagination as to how I was going to be received. I was going to be received. It's like, I, I just know this is going to, she's just going to be thrilled, she's just going to be amazed that I drove all night long to be with her. And I did, I mean, I didn't even take a shower and sleep or anything, I just went and I knocked on the door. And she opened the door and she said, what are you doing here? I says, I came to see you. She says, well, maybe we can have coffee tomorrow. I'm going out on a date. I'm just saying, the way you receive somebody matters. 
I won't tell that story anymore, but. <laughs> These soldiers are imagining that there's gonna be some dance and, and, and some songs and, and the smell of brisket, but instead the smoke that they're smelling is the, is the devastation of the fires that were set by the Philistines and they're looking around and there's nobody there and there's, they're lifting up the rubble and they're, where's their kids and where's their wife and where are their pets and everything's lost. And I, I don't know if you can imagine the pain of this moment, but some of you have been, you're old enough to know what real pain is. And this is real pain for these guys. So there was so much pain they couldn't weep anymore. This is pain, and I'll just tell you, on the road to the throne, there is high-level pain. I'll just tell you, pain can shut you down. I'm just, again, I don't want to be, I have some good things to say, but I'll just need to remind you, you cannot live in, you cannot live without some loss. It's just impossible. And, And can I just tell you that the way you process your pain has everything to do with the capacity of your glory. I'm telling you, it's true. I don't understand it all, I don't understand it all, but I'm just telling you, there is a peculiar way you enter into Christ's sufferings. There is a peculiar way that you enter into the Father's heart when you have to trust him during high levels of pain. It can't happen any other way. It just can't happen any other way. If you're gonna go to the throne, you need to be ready to process your pain. These men, it, it, it gets a little more complicated than it seems because the men who, had, who David had rescued, the men that David had, these misfit soldiers, the ones that he had raised and discipled and, and loved and given a home to these guys, now when they see their houses burned to the ground, they're filled with anger and remorse and disappointment. And they say to David, we're gonna stone you. We're holding you responsible for this condition. I don't know if anybody feels sorry for David or not. He's on his way to the throne. He's been betrayed by Saul. He's been rejected by the Philistines. He has lost his two wives and children. And now the men that he's been depending on for his community and his strength are turned against him. They're in attack mode. And I'm just telling you, on the way to the throne, The pain of being alone is the worst. The pain of being alone is a paralyzing pain. Lonely is not the same as being alone, as being alone. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, it's lonely at the top. And maybe there's somebody here that relates to the idea that, you know what, I feel like I'm the person that people, I'm just preaching to myself tonight, I'm the person that people are always going to when they have a need, but nobody ever asked me about my needs, you see. I don't know if you can relate to that. Everybody comes to me when they need help, but nobody asks me, you know, if they can help me. I don't know if forsaken is a word that you've ever experienced or not, but I'm just gonna quote Dub here because I I think it's the most dynamic truth that I've learned in this new theological season of mine. On the other side of your pain is your reign. On the other side of your pain is your reign. Yeah, the vision, Uh, you heard Katie talk about it yesterday a little bit during the Father's Day interview, but this whole idea of being a spiritual parent to so many kings and queens, like I felt so disqualified because, because I don't feel like I did a good job. I didn't do a good job with my, with my sons, even with Katie, I just, I haven't been a great father, but then all this prophetic release about, oh, you're going to be a spiritual parent, and they're going to be kings, and you're going to be all this kind of stuff. And, and, I, and I'm just like, it was so painful for anybody to prophesy over me that I would be a spiritual parent. Because anytime somebody said, you're going to be a spiritual parent, it triggered the remorse of having my own two sons not living for the Lord. And yesterday I had a conversation with Katie And I said, Katie, you wonder what our family would have been like if I had not gone into the ministry? And she said, that's a stupid question. I said, why is that a stupid question? She said, because 
Imagine the thousands of families who would not have been helped if you had not gone into the ministry. And I've just come today to ask you, especially if you're in pain on the road to your throne, don't let the pain reign in your life. Don't let it reign. Don't let the pain reign. If you're on the road to your throne, I'm almost done. If you're on the road to your throne, how you grow your hope determines your dominion. How you grow your hope. David said, I'm good. I can't tell if I'm losing you guys or not. You're okay? Because the way you receive it is an encouragement. You know, I can stop anywhere. I really, I can. I can. David says, I'm just going to encourage myself in the Lord. I'm just going to. And can I just say, if you're going to be, I, I don't want to say great leader because that's an insinuation that I think I'm a great leader and I don't think I'm a great leader, but I'm just going to tell you, if you're going to have a sphere of territory where the Father's heart is released into the earth, if, if you're going to have something that you reign over, you're going to have to learn how to do this. If you cannot encourage yourself in the Lord, you'll stay very small or you'll die, one of the two. Most people just quit at this level of pain. I mean, it's not like they're gonna make a scene and you know, jump off a building and say, this is too much pain. They'll just settle back. They'll just settle, they'll just settle down. They'll just say, I didn't know it was gonna cost this much to try to be a king. I'll just settle into a soft place here. And I'm just telling you, David offers an incredible spiritual skill to be able to say to yourself, you're gonna make it, David. To be able to say to yourself, he won't fail me. He is faithful. To be able to say to yourself, I have an anointing to be a king. To be able to say to yourself, the one that is in me is enough to get me through this season. To say it to yourself. To say, God has chosen me. He's equipped me. He's forming me to say it to yourself. To be able to say it to yourself determines how, how you're able to go forward on this road. I had a pastor call me this past week and he's just like, I was in Mexico. He called me, he says, I don't think I can keep going. I just don't know, what, tell me what advice you have. And I'm just like, well, if you know anybody that can do deliverance, go get deliverance. If you know anybody that can prophesy over you, get a prophet. If you get away, if you can, with your wife, spend some time. But at the end of the day, I'm like, dude, you're going to have to encourage yourself. Encourage yourself in the Lord. <laughs> oh, what is that? What is that? That'll have to be a whole other lesson. But it's fundamentally to see yourself through his eyes. In the Lord. I am in the Lord. I am in the Lord. And that's where your courage comes from. It's going, wait a minute. I'm in the Lord. I'm in the Lord. And I just, again, if I'm honest with you, I don't think prayer helps a lot right here. God doesn't do this for you. You have to furnish your own fight. You have to believe that you're a king when nobody else believes you're a king. <laughs> One night I w we were in uh, Vancouver, Canada. This is in the middle of our worst marriage season ever. I knew my wife hated me. <laughs> And it was about, I don't know, I don't even remember what we'd fought about, but it was something and I was so distraught. And I just got up and I just left and I walked around the streets of Vancouver pretty much all night long. And I remember the conversation that I was having with myself. And I was just like, I can't, I, I can't describe to you how frustrated I, I was, how confused I was, how much blame I was throwing at everybody else around me. And one of the sentences I heard myself say that night was, well, what are you going to do about it? 
And my first answer to the question was, I might murder my wife. But the second, the second thing, after I knew that wasn't going to happen, I was just like, dude. And there's just this humility came into my heart. I was like, let's just see. Let's just see if God can do what he promised he was going to do. And I'm not going to say like overnight our marriage was healed or anything like that, but something shifted that night when I just encouraged myself in the Lord. David is like, I'm not going to die today. I have a promise. I have a prophet who anointed me. I have a history with God. I killed a giant. I've got a destiny. I've got an anointing. This is not going to be the day my story ends. I'm on the road to a throne. I just release to you the ability to say that to yourself. Because a king has to be able to grow his own hope. I'm trying to cut some of this out because I've gone so long. Um, number four, on your road to the throne, what was three, how you grow your hope? Number four, how you hear from God. And it's interesting to me that David couldn't receive God's word until he encouraged himself in the Lord. He didn't hear direction until he encouraged himself in the Lord. The Lord said, uh, yeah, go for it, David. I, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to find something to land on here. Um, in the middle of being alone, in the middle of the rubble of his burned down city, in the middle of all that confusion and chaos and everybody turning against him, he encouraged himself in the Lord and then the Lord gave him permission. Permission is a, it's different than encouragement. You, you, you can be encouraged, but when God says, I give you permission, I give you permission to go, I give you permission to recover. And I just, I want to hang out on that for just a minute. I'll close with this. There's a lot of permission in the kingdom. In fact, as a spiritual father, I feel like that's one of the things I came to give you today. I want to give you permission to be stronger than the pain that you're living in. I want to give you permission to pursue the things that have been stolen from you. I want to give you permission to declare over yourself that you are victorious. I want to give you permission to cast out demons. I want to give you permission to imagine yourself on the throne. I want to give you permission to weep and to get through the season of weeping so that there can be a return of joy. I want to give you permission to change. I want to give you permission to pivot. I want to give you permission to live in the promises that God has announced over this generation. Yeah. Encouragement is not the same as permission, but God is giving us permission. Not just to do the works of God, but to be conformed to his image. To be more than, oh, thank God for Cindy Jacobs. She's the one who came into my life and she said, I see pastors all over the nation. I see pastors all over the world. But I am telling you, Jim Hennessy, that you have the potential to be a great pastor. You are a great pastor. She gave me permission to do things I never would have done if there wasn't somebody in my life who said, I'm giving you permission to be great in the kingdom of God. And I've come today to say over this generation, I give you permission to be great for our king. There's a territory for you to rule over. I want to give you permission to take it. I was a senior pastor when I was 23 years old. Why? Because for 23 years I'd lived with one of the greatest pastors I'd ever seen. I lived with a man who knew God. Wasn't perfect, he screwed up a lot, but he knew God. He made me believe that God was real. Somebody asked me the other day, what's your legacy? What do you want your legacy to be, Pastor Jim? What do you want to leave? And I don't have a really 
quick answer to that, but what I want to say is I want to live in such a way that there's somebody who would be able to say, I knew someone who persuaded me that God was real. Because if you could just believe that God is who he says, courage is not a problem. Getting through pain is not a problem. Changing when you've already made your plans is not a problem. You can just know for sure. And, and what I believe is that I was able to accelerate. It's Father's Day, right? I was able to accelerate some things for the king and for the kingdom because I stood on the shoulders of a, a real Christian, my dad, a real pastor. And I guess I'd like a legacy to say, I want to give you permission to accelerate the road to your thrones. I don't, I don't think you have to go through what David went through. I don't think you have to go through all that I went through. But I think that, I think there's a way that we do this together so that you can say, you can accelerate. Accelerate the destiny that's over your life. Let's stand together, please. Um, I've went so long, but I think, I think it's important we worship the Lord again, and then I'll come back for a quick closing prayer. How about that? Let's worship the Lord.